What a fucking... Niger is the name of the country. So, now that we got that out of the way, uh, this is Bosnian Reacts to Geography Now, Niger, as I said this time. Okay, I just want to point some things out in my uh, last two videos. I did say in one, in one part of the video of wh whoever is like, you know, not into the Lord of the Rings of Psychopath. I was just being <laughs> over dramatic. okay? I wasn't... Because some people took that really seriously. Like, I vehemently think that is the, the greatest movie. It, for me, it is the greatest movie. If it's not for you, that's completely fine like i know i was talking to this one of my uh friends when i worked at a hotel he he loved mafia films so much but for me mafia films were like eh, like scarface and godfather for me the experience was eh, no big deal i mean it was it was a good film well directed and everything but uh, i'm just really not into the mafia a whole lot because i know the mafia is not a you know, a place for hope where you can actually, in, even in a poor country, succeed. For me, the mafia is a criminal syndicate and they need to be rooted out. <laughs> that, that's what I... But everybody likes to romanticize about them. But, um, you know, for me, not a whole big big experience. I had a much better experience with The Lord of the Rings. When the charges of Rohirrim uh, started, man, that was just like the greatest part out of any movie for, for me. But I just want to get that clear. I'm not that big on films that much anymore because uh, this year I only watched like three films. I watched Deadpool 2, I watched Avengers Endgame, and I watched John Wick 3. And my thoughts on all three of them, John Wick 3 was not as good as John Wick 1 or 2. And uh, what else did I say? Uh, Avengers End Endgame, I thought the first part was better with Thanos than the, the second part. Still a very good film, but not as good as the first one. Um, and uh, Deadpool 2 was pretty good. Hang on, I got a very important text. Just... And we're back. Sorry about that. My uh, boss texted me about something I had to do real quick. So uh, we should be fine now. Anyway, but to the video. Niger. Uh, what was I talking about? Something about films? And Oh yeah, one more thing I wanted to mention. Many people have, would have noticed the Estonia video was also taken down. I took it that down for copyright reasons. Uh, for those who don't know, at the beginning of the... Of the, of the video Estonian the Estonians were fine uh, I had I had no hold bars against uh, you know the, the Estonians and the Estonians in the comment section were good people it was not because the Estonians I took it down it was because at the beginning of the video I actually featured a part of uh, Game of Thrones where I shouldn't have and I fe featured the sound in it and apparently it got copyrighted and I took it down now I want my channel to be completely clean of any copyright claims anything at all I want it to be completely you know I have a clean slate a very very <laughs> perfect channel if you, if you can so I want to stay away from all those copyright claims so I'm probably just going to end up doing it doing it again I want to revise a couple of these videos anyway so I will be taking down some of them and revising them because for for many reasons, I want I want to revise some of the some of the videos, uh, things that I just got completely wrong, and I ended up just humiliating myself. So I really want to like uh, redo some of these. So uh, potentially I will do in the future, uh, redo some of these videos, and also uh, go back and maybe fix some of the commentary I did in the videos before. Now, anyway, let's get into the video of Niger. Like I said, I don't know much about this country besides it has like apparently a lot of uranium. I think. Uh, the Niger River flows through here, and uh, they have, like, the most babies per capita, I think. And that's about it. <laughs> Niger, not Nigeria. Two completely different countries. Equally fascinating. One has skyscrapers and oil fields. The other has uranium and dancing face-painted men that put on a beauty pageant for female judges that get to sleep with the winner that they select. We need to learn from these people. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Not too many people know too much about Niger. It doesn't pop up on many tourism sites and is usually just a footnote in the books about Africa. Literally in Lonely Planet's book on West Africa, this is all they have on Niger. But for what it's worth, this country is fascinating to say the least. And dare I say- Also, it looks like India. This kind of- lesser known reaches of the planet. And speaking of the planet, here's the map. The closest flag to India, really. <laughs> now, if there was any country that exemplified the definition of a Saharan nation, it would probably be either Niger or Mauritania. Remember that episode? Man, one day I want to ride that train. Niger played an important role throughout history, and if you dig deep in the sand, you'll start to understand why. First of all, the country is the largest in West Africa, landlocked, bordered by seven other countries, and makes up 1.3 million square kilometers or 500,000 square miles. And the shape of the country kind of looks like a chicken drumstick. The country is divided <laughs> into seven regions and one capital district for the capital and largest city, Niamey, located in the southwest. After that, the second largest city is Zinder in the southeast and Maradi in the central south. Speaking of which, about 95% of the population. Wow, there's like barely any green spots, let's be honest. 
in this country. The region lives in the south, where most of the road networks lie. The largest and least populated and the green of zones is the massive Agadez region in the north, where only one paved road goes all the way up and stops at the mining town of Arlit. Otherwise, from there, there are only dirt paths through the desert that reach the nearly uninhabited outskirts of the unforgiving northeastern Saharan regions. They extend to the furthest settlement, Madalma, a military outpost that patrols the border with Libya and Chad. Otherwise, from Libya, you have only one main road that passes through the Kuru Arkene airstrip that is actually split by the border of both countries, and from there, good luck. Within the country, there are two international airports, Niamey's Diori Hamani International and Agadez's Mano Dayak International up north. Currently, the country is in the process of constructing a rail line that will connect to Benin and onwards to the port of Cotonou for cargo transport to the Atlantic Ocean. A station has already been built at Niamey, and future stations are being worked on. Now, aside from some river boundaries in the south, most of the current borders of Niger were kind of arbitrarily drawn between the French and other regional powers during colonial times. That's Until usually how it Niger goes. We kind of used to have half of Chad's land, but then it was like, all right, West and Central African colonies, how we doing? We, we hate, hate you. you. Ah, good as usual, I see. Anyways, is there anything you'd like to discuss? Yeah, now that you mention it, why does Niger get like the entire Tebesti and Eddie plateau when most of his people are over 2,000 kilometers away? I mean... You drew these lines, what do you expect me to say? Okay, fine, Chad. You're taking over the Anetti area thing. Thank fine, you. But, but we, we still, still hate, hate you. you. Otherwise, if Niger was known for something, it would be kind of like the country with the most remote and difficult to reach landmarks, hidden away in the empty uninhabited deserts with limited access options. Now, the uh, Saharan deserts weren't, the Sahara wasn't actually always, you know, a desert. Uh, it, 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 during the Milankovitch cycles, which uh, the, 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 the Earth's tilt, you know, changes ever so slightly, uh, the, uh, the equator actually receives a lot more sunlight, actually absorbing uh, more heat and creating uh, low pressure uh, area zones. And the, then it creates high pressure zones in the uh, uh, Atlantic and the high pressure zones move into the low pressure zones. This is uh, climatology 101. And uh, it actually receives, starts receiving more rain. So what's ironic, many people assume that due to global warming, which is a thing, and if it actually does happen, the Sahara wouldn't actually get more drier, believe it or not. Because it would cause more heat and more, more low pressure zones, this is going to cause more high pressure, um, high pressure um, zones moving into the low pressure zones, which, I, which would actually cause more rain. And it, we have proof that... that uh, Back in the days, if you all watch, if anybody watches Atlas Pro, you would you you would have seen the video. This is where I got it. This is where I got it from. Like Lake Chad would be as large as uh, the the Caspian uh, Sea because a lot of these uh, zones in the Sahara are actually like basins. So you would actually have the water flow into those basins. You would have to actually have a lot of lakes. Uh, so which is why you would see like many landmarks inside of like the Sahara zones because the Sahara wasn't always like you know. Uh, pl a place we know uh, today it was a much more greener place. Now, the the, the next Milankovitch cycle is going to happen in like many thousands of years, so we don't have to like even think about. But if but if we do um, anything with like global global warming, uh, the the Sahara will save us and <laughs> actually get more grasslands and more carbon sinks, I guess. I mean, if you zoom in, you can see the UTA Flight 772 crash site monument with no roads leading to it. It's just a monument in the middle of the sand, hundreds of kilometers away from the nearest town. They actually last, there used built to be that. one last living tree in the middle of the Tenere Desert with no others in a 400 kilometer radius until a drunk driver knocked it over in the 70s, and now they've placed a metallic monument. So he was that drunk. There was only one tree. He was so drunk, he, he swerved into j just the one tree, nowhere else. Oh, my God. In the tree's honor. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you decide to visit some places of interest, <laughs> that is things like this hilariously desert caravan sad. town, the Maradi Palace and Grand Bazaar, the National Museum of Niger, the Jado and Jaba city ruins, Agadez Grand Mosque, the that looks pretty Hippo cool. Tours, I like that. this old cemetery in Gobero, these cave engravings, the Tuareg Festival grounds and markets of Taua, the really difficult to get to lush crop oasis of Timia, Kaure Giraffe Reserve, the Animal Bazaar of Balayara, Zinder is kind of like the cultural capital of the country with ruins, the Birni Quarter and the Sultan's Palace. On their I do like how a lot of these African states are like uh, starting their own architecture, which I have noticed is very like beige and brown. Has anybody checked out like some African architecture? It's usually always like beige and brown, different to like uh, what we see in Europe where you see large glass structures today, which I'm not a big fan of. I do like the Victorian era like architecture. That's like my favorite architecture. Uh, or like the Austro-Hungarian architecture is also very good. That, that's my favorite. Instead of these, you know, glass 
uh, boxes we have. Also, like one of the largest uh, buildings here in Bosnia and Sarajevo, the Sarajevo city center. Looks like somebody crumpled up a piece of paper and said, yeah, you know what? This is going to be uh, the largest uh, mall in, th in Bosnia. I'm not a big fan. <laughs> I just got There's a national that. park called W National Park. Yeah, that's just the name W National Park. It's pretty cool with lots of animals and stuff. Creative. And speaking <laughs> of nature and animals, this makes the perfect transition into the next segment. The... Now, Niger sticks out physically because on the surface, it seems kind of desolate. But if you look closer, you'll see all these weird clues that give you a picture on how the area used to look like thousands of years ago before the desert took over. First of all, Niger is one of the hottest countries on Earth, often called the frying pan of the world. I mean, you you disregard because it looks like a frying thing, pan. It also kind of looks like a frying pan. Raindrops <laughs> are said to sometimes evaporate before they even hit the ground. About 80 percent of the country is made of. That's actually known as a dry storm, and th they don't occur just in the Sahara. They actually occur in places like Australia. Where even before it hits the ground, it's you know, it uh, evaporates. So if you have a forest fire, unfortunately, the the rain sometimes can't even take out that forest fire, which is why Australia gets a lot of forest fires because even even though some of them start in like in Europe, Europe has a lot of rain and the rain you know like, takes down the forest fires. Of Saharan and Tenere Desert, which by the way holds the Ayer and Tenere Nature Reserves, a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the fourth largest nature reserve in the world. The country has three main extinct volcano lava field plateaus the Jabo Plateau in the northeast, the smaller Zinder Plateau further south, where you can find the tallest peak, Idukal Ntages. Almost the entire country is located in either the Sahara or Sahel zone, which gives them a line of agriculture versus a line of grazing for livestock. This little dangling salient right here in the south of the Tilaberi region is part of the W National Park and is the wettest and greenest area in all of Niger. To the west, you get the longest and most important river of the country, the Niger River. Is it navigable? Its name from I think it is. Through the, capital, Niamey. the Niger River is strange because it kind of flows in a backwards yeah, that crescent, is, starting in the Guinea Highlands and then ends in the Gulf of Guinea in Niger. I, I just wonder if they like actually like dug uh, you know, some of these mountains off of Guinea, would it actually just flow into, into the ocean? Well, I guess uh, the Niger River also has a lot of tributaries, so it, w it wouldn't really do that. I, I'm just really interested in like geo geomorphing. It's actually like morphing the land to your own uh, to your own will. I wish there were like more video games like that because I really like to play around with like the land physics and creating my own rivers and stuff. Because if you can tell, I'm a big fan of like uh, geomorphing. <laughs> and uh, geology in general. Area. This river provides water and irrigation to over a quarter of the entire <coughs> population. If you zoom in on the Tahua region, you can even see the outline of former flowing river tributaries that irrigated mm. much of the land inland. Otherwise, a series of guelta, or drainage basins, can be found all over, about a thousand of them in the country, 175 of which are permanent, fed by underwater aquifers. They provide many outskirt communities with water as well. The largest inland body of water is the northwestern section of Lake Chad, split between between four countries, and today it is seeing the effects of desertification and drying up, unfortunately. Yeah, Niger is quite dry, but they have their way of getting around and adapting. And speaking of dry, it's time for my triple shot of espresso break, which means the one and only Noah takes over this segment. Here, hold this, would you? Now, as we mentioned, Niger is interesting because long ago, much of it was covered in savanna and grassland before the sands came in. Only about 1% of the land is covered in forests and about 3% is cultivated for farming. This is kind of mind-boggling considering that somewhere around 87% of the workforce is engaged in agriculture and subsistence farming. Now, take into account that they constantly face droughts and desertification, and it's quite a tense situation to say the least. The crops they mostly grow are groundnuts and cotton with a somewhat noticeable livestock trade, mostly with Nigeria. Nonetheless, it's mineral exports that make them the most Money at about 40% of the overall exports. There was even a gold rush when gold was discovered in the Jabo Plateau in 2014. Yeah, you would think the Sahara is just a bunch of useless sand and rocks, but nope. Nonetheless, the Agadez region is a money. Unfortunately, a lot of these African countries that uh, have huge reserves, gold reserves, cobalt reserves, you name it, uranium reserves, uh, the reason they don't really get that rich off of it because they have to resort to, because they're so poor, they have to resort, resort to. Uh, Manual labor, as you can see, uh, just, just workers getting in there, putting uh, uh, pieces of gold, I guess, gold ore, and just pick, carrying it back up through the mine now th because they don't have actually the uh, expertise and the machines needed to actually create a, uh, you know, a sufficient mine, a very profitable mine like you would have like in, say, in Canada, for example, where they have, you know, machines and people operating the machines and engineers, and that's why the, the mines become very, very profitable. Like this, it's like very slow when it comes to you know the the uh, the collecting of gold, for example, which is why 
which is why they would need foreign you know investments but unfortunately due to a lot of corruption and ease of doing business is usually very difficult in africa people instead opt out of investing in uh, potential sources like this and and this, this is why the Africa cannot achieve its true potential, even though it has so much resource. Moneymaker being the fifth largest uranium producer on Earth, the mine close to the town of Arlit. Otherwise, despite the lack of cropland, they still have their own national dishes, which brings us to food. First off, most meals start with a staple starch, the most common one being millet. Fish is the most common meat, specifically mackerel. Stews are very common as well. Otherwise, you have dishes like... Kilishi, Moringa, Kula Nuts, Wache, Spice Crickets, Katabara, Rochettes, Pura, Oak Bono, or African Bush Mango. And of course, like much of West Africa, they have their own version of jollof rice. Yeah, they are that actually looks spicy. The original. <laughs> Excuse me? And speaking of their own versions of things, let's talk about the versions of people, shall we? This is going to be good. Uh, thank you, Noah. You're welcome. Okay, so first of all, a person from Niger is called a Nigerian with an E. Add an A and you have Nigerian, which is the uh, episode after. Because it's French. Just like almost every African country, Kinda. the people of Niger a slew of ethno-linguistic people groups. Each have their own customs, traditions, tribal affiliation, and story. And the story of Niger gets pretty interesting when you break it down. First of all, the country has about 21 million people and as of 2019 has the world's highest birth rate with about 7 yeah. births per woman, making them the lowest seven. median age per population at about 15.4 years. The country is made of of a number of ethnicities, the largest parent group being the Hausa, at Hausa Fulani, the Zarma Songhai at 21.2%, uh, the Songhai Empire, the Fula at about another 10%, and the rest are other groups like the Kanuri Manga, the Tubu, a few Arabs, and others. They use the West African franc as their currency, they use the types A, B, C, D, and E, and F type plug outlets, yeah, they use a lot, and they drive on the right side of the road. As a former French colony, of course, French is the official language of administration. It's used Francais. <laughs> Not Francais, Francais. However, there are 10 recognized national languages spoken by the majority of people, Hausa and Zarma Songhai being the most commonly spoken. The vast majority of the country claims to be Muslim. However, much like we discussed in the Mali episode, Islam in Niger is kind of different from what you'd find in other Muslim majority areas. And it's, it's probably animistic, synchronized. What classifies as doctrinal versus syncretic Islam. Stemming mostly from the Malikite yeah, Sunni branch Not whatever I say. students, you get a lot of African traditional belief syncretism within the Muslim community. This incorporates a lot of influence from animism like shrines, charms, possession rituals, and so on. The most famous one being the Bori cult. Most women do not wear hijabs and often expose their arms, necks, and legs. Alcohol is allowed. They even have their own local beer brand. Otherwise, Bier, Christians Niger. make up the majority of the <laughs> remaining non-Muslim community. The nation is classified as a secular state, although much of the laws stem from Islam. Niger has a lot of history that dates back millennia BC. It's been part of numerous empires and kingdoms and trade routes that predated colonial rule. I mean, today they even have five constituent monarchs in five regions. We'll get into that soon. But first, let's kind of break down the largest main people groups. The Hausa, Zarma Songhai, and Toreg, and Kula. And here is Random Hannah to explain. All right, let's get this started. The Hausa are the largest ethnic group in Africa. They even have their own Hausa flag. They number around 70 million, 10 million of which, mostly on the southern border, are found in Niger. They are mostly known for being very business oriented, relatively strong in Islamic tradition. They have some very decorative architecture and traditional attire. The Zarma Songhai live mostly in the southwest along the Niger River, and they are known for being the more westernized metropolitan peoples that speak better French and typically work in the service sector. They are famous for the griot performers that tell stories in a musical fashion. They also have interesting traditional huts found close to the capital. The Tuareg are sometimes called the blue people because of the indigo dyes they wear on their clothing. They mostly reside in the more arid parts of the northern Sahara region, and they even have their own ethnic flag. Related to the Berber and other countries, they have a unique millennia-old history of desert culture. Most of them are divided into castes and clans. Some have tribal markings. Men actually wear the veil, whereas women do not. Camels are commonly used for transport, and you can pretty much tell if someone is Tuareg if they are wearing the cross of Agadez. Finally, the Fulani looks like a nether star. <laughs> the largest nomadic people group on Earth, and Niger has about two million. They mostly inhabit the lower central regions of the country. They have a wide range of colorful festivals festivals, rich ceremonies, and traditions. One of the most famous ones being the Gerawal festival of somewhat taboo tradition in the Wadabe tribe. Men put on layers of taboo and do a tradition. performance for the women that get to choose the winner. These women often have permission from their husbands to sleep with the winners in an attempt to have oh. beautiful children. 
Sometimes social structures across the world are just like that. Yeah, Nat Geo is actually kind of like obsessed with these people. Anyway, Hannah, uh, thank you. Um, actually, can I try holding that again? Yeah. Oh. Now, of course, there are many other groups and subgroups. I take back what I said about it. <laughs> languages and customs, but those were kind of like the big four. Otherwise, we cannot gloss over the fact that the country does have some social issues widely known already throughout the world. They only recently abolished slavery in 2003, although the practice of caste-based slavery and human trafficking still is an issue that the country faces. For years, there has been a continuous struggle against Boko Haram, which started in Nigeria, and it has a few factions in Niger. Add on top of that, the overall poverty, illiteracy, and political instability through a series of insurrection and coups. You can see how all this kind of puts a struggle. One of the most impoverished are still states. Trying, trying to move forward with new modern economic sectors like tourism and resource extraction. It's kind of like. I'm a tourist. Can, can I come visit? Oh yeah, no, this I'm good. You know, don't mind all this. It's just internal issues. Totally fine. Come on in. Come visit. Have a good time. Yeah, it's okay. totally safe. Otherwise, <laughs> history. In the quickest way I can put it, prehistoric era, Trans-Saharan trade route, Songhai Empire, Islam enters. Meanwhile, Hausa kingdoms in the south and Kanem Bornu Empire in. The East, Mali Empire takes over, French expedition years, this queen lady fights back, French abolished slavery amongst the Touaregs, France has full colonial rule, independence, first military regime, uranium boom, second republic, third republic, first Touareg rebellion, Typical. second military regime, fourth republic and third military regime, fifth republic, second Touareg rebellion, Man. sixth republic, seventh They learned republic, a lot from France. <laughs> yeah, three military regimes and seven republics and two Touareg rebellions. I told you, it's uh, kind of it's like France. Otherwise, some notable people from Niger or of Nigerian descent might include people like full disclaimer i'm going to pronounce all these probably wrong alfadi nisafatu musa adamu ismail eragai alasan bombino mustafa alasane abdul razak isafu musa mazu mamane wasonga yeah for a place with barely any cultivated land yet fast growing population of over 20 million you can tell there's something interesting about this place let's see how the outside world responds to the uniqueness now shall we <laughs> Now, Niger is the fastest growing country in Africa with the highest birth rate. This means that with limited resources at their disposal, their dependence on foreign interactions is probably going to be wars. The continuity of their nation's future. For one, even though the colonial past holds a slight sting in the minds of Nigerians, France is not only their largest import and export partner, especially in the uranium sector, but also still has a cultural connection with Niger. They've adopted a lot of French cuisine, French is the official language used for intercommunication, and many students choose to continue their studies in France. Americans are kind of like the backup default out when the French aren't concerned. They've been friendly since independence, and even amidst the political drama, they never cut ties. In 2013, they signed an agreement to allow U.S. bases to operate and test military equipment in their territory, as well as help train the Nigerian military. The U.S. also invests in their economy to some extent. In general, their West African neighbors are the closest friends, but it depends on who you ask. If you ask the Hausa community, they'll probably say Nigeria is their best friend, as many of their Hausa cousins also live in Nigeria. In addition, Ghana and Benin give them access to the ocean. Otherwise, many in the Zarma Songhai community will probably say that Mali and Burkina Faso are the best friends. Not only is business big between them, but they share the same history of empires, challenges in modern society, and to some extent culture. They also share many of the same people groups, and they have a shared dependence on the Niger River. In conclusion, when you look at Niger, first you see, you know, just sand and rocks, but then you see this incredibly fast-growing population. They've gotten this far and kept the colorful traditions alive. Let's see what the future holds for them. Stay tuned. Nigeria! Is coming up next. Watch out for your emails, guys. It's Nigeria. Hey everybody, welcome back to Flag Slash Fan Friday. Hope you liked the Niger episode. Yeah, it was pretty good. As you know, this is the part where I talk about the things that I made a few small mistakes on or the things that didn't quite make it into the video. Uh, for one, I believe we got the wrong image of Ismail Era Guy Alasane. Sorry, it's just I googled it and I figured that was him but it wasn't i've never i've never seen the guy sorry i accidentally wrote fonse instead of fonse. <laughs> i noticed in that the animation it says less than 25 percent and not greater than 25 percent and uh in the history part we accidentally used the francophone map not the map of french west africa sorry about that when in the video when i said the tallest peak could be found in one of the mountain chains i forgot to say it was the air mountains i mean we caught it in the animation but I, for I forgot to say it actually while recording my voice otherwise niger has a lot of other cool spots that i didn't mention there's like the extinct caldera of Arakal. We also forgot to mention that Niger does have some oil reserves. They've just tapped it. America wants to know your location. 
fuel, mostly in crude oil. Also, uh, their national sports uh, up north, mostly it's horse. By the way, the Americans, I'm of course saying that as a joke, but Americans actually do have enough oil for themselves now due to advancements in fracking technology. They are actually, with Canada and Mexico now, actually energy independent, so, which is why you don't see America uh, anymore, really, in any of the oil states anymore. Horse and camel racing, huge equestrian culture, especially in the Sahel region. Also, I forgot to talk about Soro or Lute Tradicional or Kokoa in Hausa. Lute Tradicional. That means do. traditional it's, uh, fight. Very popular throughout the entire country. And also, I was told if you go to Niger, do not eat in the streets. It's considered very kind of trashy and rude. All right, so that's just about it. Uh, I did that all the time when I was in college. Topic. So without further ado. <laughs> Okay, not gonna lie, Niger, I think I'm gonna have to add it to my travel list. It's whenever I research a country, I always like get this urge to like maybe I should just buy a flight ticket and go there. This one really hit me hard, man. I mean, not only does it have a lot of cool secret hidden things in it, but it's like very few tourists. Mm, I love that. Anyway, the flag. The flag is a horizontal tricolor of orange, white, and green bands with an orange disc in the center. The flag is often confused for the flag of India from a distance, but just keep in mind that the ratio I, I is wasn't confused, narrower, by the way. <laughs> the orange color darker, and the orange disc in the middle is obviously not a blue spoked wheel in the center. According to common tradition, the orange represents... Many people were like going to write in the comments, so, oh, it's not a cool few idiots, you know, it's, it's not India. Stands for pure like, I didn't know. Say the Niger River as well. And finally, the green at the bottom stands for hope and the fertile regions of the southern part of the country. The orange disc in the center is supposed to stand for the sun or independence. Now, prior to this, they didn't have a national flag. They were just a territory in the larger entity of French West Africa, so they just kind of used the French flag. It is important to note, though, that separate kingdoms and empires that had land that are in the modern day boundaries of Niger, some of them actually did have their own flags. The Sokoto Caliphate, which was mostly in Nigeria but also had some land in Niger, they used just a flat, solid green banner. And hey, the Libya. Gordon <laughs> Empire, which was in the east, mostly in Chad but had a little bit in Niger as well, they used this flag with a palm tree on it. But yeah, for the most part, throughout its history, Niger was just split amongst many people groups and they weren't really unified until after independence from the French Empire. And yeah, so that brings us to the coat of arms. The coat of arms du Niger. Gold shield in the center with Guess what it means. It. The first being a Hausa spear with a pair of cross Touareg swords representing the two parts of the culture that make up the country as well as defense of the nation. On the right, three pearl millet heads, the most commonly grown grain mm -hmm. representing agriculture. In the bottom center, a zebu head symbolizing the livestock and herding culture. And finally, the sun in the middle. On the sides of the shield are four draped flags of Niger. And at the bottom lies a banner reading République de Niger. And of course, prior to this, they didn't really have any other coat of arms. Although they do sometimes kind of switch up the colors of the shield a little bit. Like the, instead of gold, it might be black. But yeah, either way, that's uh, pretty much all there is to uh, Niger symbolism. So with that being done and said, you know what time it is. The end of the video. So I'd like to thank you all for watching. And as always, take care.